This is William and Lonsdale, a podcast about the legal ecosystem and the fascinating people who make it tick. Today, your host, Michael Green, speaks with ex-police officer and current CEO of Police Veterans Victoria, Dave McGowan. Dave began his career as a young constable in the inner suburbs of Melbourne, essentially living out his childhood dream of playing cops and robbers. As his career progressed, the harsh realities of the job certainly set in, but Dave remained passionate about his work and commitment to the service. As a member of the armed robbery squad, he worked on many major cases that he stayed with as they progressed through the courts, working with solicitors, barristers, and importantly, shepherding witnesses through the process. And now, as CEO of Police Veterans Victoria, he works to support the thousands of former officers affected by the work they did on the job, as it's known. Today we discuss all this and more, and Dave shares his lens on the justice system and on how much things have changed over the decades since he first began policing. When I started, there was a a level of fear and respect, and one sort of went with the other as well. That made life a lot simpler and that made us far more effective. And there was an environment where you could deal with minor street kid issues effectively without bringing it into the court system. We, we were out and about, we were on the road, we were in everyone's faces all the time. In South Melbourne, we owned, we owned the town. We knew all the kids. We knew all the local crooks. We knew who the good crooks were, the dumb crooks, the young ones, the old ones. We, we had relationships and sadly that seems to have gone. These days they say half the public hate coppers for what they did and the other half hate them for what they didn't do. Good morning and welcome to Lies in the Law. Our guest this morning is David McGowan. David is a former policeman, had a long and distinguished career in the police force, but currently is CEO of a very important body, really, for policemen and retired policemen called Police Veterans Victoria. And David, I'd like to start by having you explain to us what Police Veterans Victoria is, what role it fulfills, and why do we need it? Great. Good segue into uh, <laughs> to what's going to be an interesting conversation and thanks for inviting me along. Police Veterans Victoria started in 2019. Uh, it, it was originally run by some veteran members looking after other veterans who are troubled by their experiences in the job. Can I just can I just clarify, this is for officers who have retired from the police force? Who have left, yes. former members. Yeah. Yep. That started out as a small group and Graham Ashton was the Chief Commissioner of the day, found out and said, we need to do something to professionalise it. They did a big fundraising walk, raised some money, seed funding to get it started. I came in about around a year after it first started and kind of knocked it over and started it again, including rebranding it to the name that we now have. Predominantly, it is a peer support group. We're a registered charity that look after police veterans and their family members. And the issues that we deal with include post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety, drug and alcohol abuse, homelessness, had a number of them we found living in their cars, some very sad plays out there from their time in the job and no one was looking after them and that's where we come into it. So in the first year, our referrals went up 500%. We've maintained that increase year on year for the last three years. So we had about 20 referrals a month from different sources. And then for what level of staffing have you got to be able to provide, so help look after these people? I have a social worker that Victoria Police provide to me, uh, to our organisation. I have me, a communications officer, and 75 volunteers. So volunteers do support work with they do. The people that are struggling yep. in life. So they, we put them through a two-day training course and the basis of that is that they have a lived experience. They understand what you're going through. They've seen it. They've been there. They've walked that walk. And uh, veteran police particularly will relate better to those who have some insights into what they're going through. I was 20 years out of the police family. When I came back into this job, I was quite confronting to see the amount of trauma out there and and to know that there was nobody looking after them. And we're the only ones in the country. Other states don't have it, yet we're supporting other state police at the moment. I was going to say, are other state police 
looking at it and thinking, gee, we need to do this? They do. Queensland are on board. We expect to have Police Veterans Queensland up this year. Western Australia are looking at it, but we're still working through other states to get that body on board. What we find is the more we communicate our story and our purpose, they all start coming to us because they can't find anything in their home state. So it's clearly a need. Do governments appreciate the need? I think they appreciate it, but they, at this point they're yet to fund us, um, which is a real point of frustration for us when we see the support that's provided to defence veterans and good on them. It's great that they get it. Compared to what police veterans get, it, it is uh, appalling. It's Someone described it as a hidden tragedy, and it is, that police often go to war every day on the van or on a particular job, and they do it day in, day out. They see things that most people don't want to see, don't ever see. Including members of the Defence Forces. They, they wouldn't see the, the daily trauma that police officers see. No, they don't. Yeah. No, there's a, there's a saying, another saying I heard, I pick up lots of sayings in this job, that the military often train every day for a one-day event and coppers train one day for an everyday event. Yeah. It's the only job, other job I know where there's people out there deliberately setting out to kill you, they stab you, shoot you, run you over, uh, attack you. So there's a price that comes with that. Okay, well, we'll get back to it because I'd like to explore that further. But let's go back to the start of your career. How did you become a policeman? Were you in a police family? Was there a history of policing? Why the police force for you as a young man? Or, or even, I guess you might have thought about it when you were a kid. Oh, I was a kid. You know, a lot of kids want to be policemen and firemen. I wanted to be a policeman and I never grew out of it. And, and I grew up watching police shows like Division 4 and Homicide and Matlock Police. Those Crawford productions were obviously great recruiting tools for, for the police. That, I grew up on that and that's what I wanted to do, hella high water, that's where I was going. And, and I did. What about your parents? Did you come to parents and say, I want to be a policeman? And they, they, were they happy or do they have other plans for you? Uh, well, I finished school, passed HSC, got enrolled at university at Deakin uh, in Geelong. That's where they thought I was heading. I had flagged it, particularly with my dad saying, this is what I want to do, and he scoffed at it and said, well, that's not a career and I don't think you'd get in anyway. You're too skinny. I said, oh, okay. So I didn't engage them again and I went through the recruitment process, unbeknown to them, came up to Melbourne, did the interviews, got accepted, got a start date and went to university for the orientation week. And then after that, I said, I'm out of here. I'm going to join the police force. Well, what makes you think you'll get in? I said, well, see, I'm in and I'm starting next Monday. So off I went. So you're you're at that stage, I'm assuming, 17 or 18? 18. 18. When an 18-year-old walks into the police academy, what training does he he or she undergo? How are you prepared for what is a, a very confronting career, potentially confronting career? Oh, definitely. How are we prepared? We're not. We walk into the police academy on day one. The majority of the intakes, the squads in those days, were all young. They were cadets, which were younger than me. You had to be 18 and a half before you could graduate. So some of the cadets would start a little bit later, but hey, we had no idea. We went into the police chapel, we got sworn in, we were put in our squads and we hit the books. And for the next 20 weeks, we learned all the theory and the procedure and the operational tactics and the fitness and all the things that you work your way through, and we passed out 20 weeks later. Knowing precisely nothing. Knowing nothing. <laughs> that's right. And was, was it, I mean, I would assume that's a huge culture shock because the police has got, the police force got a unique culture of its own. Yes. And anyone coming into the police force, unless they had a parent or a family member, a serving police officer, I don't think they could be prepared for that culture or be aware of what that culture is. No, only what we see on TV. That's all we knew, unless you knew a police member yeah. who would tell you, but even they wouldn't tell you much. But we joined the job, and I don't know whether you've heard that saying, but policing is referred to as the job, yeah. as if there are no other vocations except this one. It's still a term now, I'm in the job. Yeah. I was in the job. They all know what you're talking about. So you come out at 19 or 18 and a half? I was on my 19th birthday, I graduated. Where do they post you to? What duties do they give a very green and wet behind the ears young police officer? So they had a training program. So I got posted to Geelong uh, for 12 weeks. And in that 12 weeks, he spent two weeks in the watch house looking after prisoners and counter inquiries, a week at the local D24, a week with the crime car squad, then back at the station and you work the divan for the remainder of that period. And at the end of 12 weeks, everybody would get transferred to what was called Force Reserve, Russell Street. 
And from there you were billeted out on foot patrols. There was a barracks upstairs that young Connie's had to live in. I was lucky. I uh, was told by blokes I worked with at Geelong, start putting in for vacancies to not go to Russell Street. And I was really lucky to get posted to South Melbourne. So that was my first appointed station. In any of these places, do people now, or did you back then, have an appointed mentor? No, nothing like that. And and today, do they have mentors today? I don't think they've got the resources to do it like that. So no, they don't. Have, they don't work like that. It, it would seem a no-brainer to me that there should be a mentor. Yeah, yeah. Well, it certainly makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, but you you would be rostered on the on the divisional van with twenty or thirty different people, uh, so you rarely work the same shift with the same person more than twice, except on night shift, and there might be three of you on night shift or five. Uh, two in the van and one in the watch house, then you'd spend the whole week together. But generally, you work the van with different shifts with different people and every one of them has their own different style. Was it confronting? I mean, being in a, in a divisional van around the streets of inner Melbourne, seeing, I'm assuming, homeless people, drunk people, uh, people uh, drug-affected, violent people, mm. confronting? Scare, uh, a bit scary, maybe? A little bit. Confronting, for sure. Um, There's things that I saw that uh, you can't really imagine or prepare for until you see it, your first dead body. And, you know, in those early years, you would encounter death on a daily basis. Really? On a a daily basis? Yeah. If there was a, well, particularly in in a suburb. So if there was a cold snap, there's a lot of boarding houses around South Melbourne and the other inner suburbs. So in a cold snap, they'd die in the boarding houses. In a heat wave, they'd die there. Lots of suicides, accidents, car accidents. So I reckon in my first five or six years, I think I pretty much saw death in every conceivable way. Um, I, I guess it's not surprising, but for a young person, I wonder whether it's a bit sort of brutalising to you. You've got to, I assume, put in place some sort of a barrier between you and death to even cope with it. Yeah, you do, and others cope with it well. I didn't have any trouble with it. I didn't personalise it. The, the times I had, the hardest job I had was delivering a death message. Uh, they're the most difficult but dealing with the death itself, uh, you manage to separate that, yeah. that they're not a person to you anymore. That's how you have to deal with it. So you, like everyone else, have several years in uniform. Yep. I guess basically everyone wants to become a detective. In those days, most wanted to be a detective. Less so now. What do you have to do to move across to detective? Or what did you have to do then? So in uh, most of the stations, the the sergeants, senior sergeants were all former detectives. So for me, it was, yep, I want to be in a CIB, I want to be a detective, get on a suit, do good jobs. You start working towards that ambition very early in in your police career. So you start looking for good crooks, lock up better crooks, get trials underway. What do you mean good crooks and better crooks? Okay, so good crooks are the ones, yeah, probably a bad term, isn't it? A good crook is someone who's a professional criminal who does it for a living, whether they're safe breakers, arm robbers, burglars, the ones that are just not your local fool. Um, So we aim to get experience and exposure in the criminal briefs. So on the van you'd grab any job you could that wasn't a shoplifter or something like an assault. But if it was a serious assault, I'll take that. Housebreakers, assault and robs, any of those kinds of briefs, you'd be all over it. So you would build up to that point You'd start getting a dossier, you'd get temporary duties in the CIB after about four years, uh, secondments to plainclothes unit. So I went into the Russell Street Special Duties Squad. We did a lot of drug work back then. So your whole aim was to build towards getting to a CIB board. You'd do some preparation, you'd take a, a examples of all the briefs that you'd done, you'd get references from former detectives who are supervisors, and you'd front a panel and ask a whole lot of questions, reasonably senior people, officers that would run these panels, and then you'd get a classification. So A, A plus, A or A minus. Um, that determined your order of application for vacancies, and then you just had to try like mad to get a spot. In those days, you had to be appointed in the CIB within 12 months of becoming a senior county, otherwise you couldn't get in again. That was a very narrow window. And... In making this application and hopefully being successful, do they look at um, your conviction rate, these good and better crooks that you've picked up, do they look at them and say, well, yes, he prepared this case well, he uh, had all his evidence in order and he got a conviction? No. 
convictions really weren't factored in. Uh, our, our job was to put the brief up. Um, well, what happens if, I mean, you need to, to organise a good brief. Absolutely. Uh, chronological, logical, something that the prosecutor could work with. Yeah. It couldn't just be slapdash. No, no, not at all. But that wasn't really, there was never any lens put over your conviction rate because it wasn't up to us. Mm. Um, as you well know, juries, it's a complex process, the jury process. So, mm. and I took a view very early in my police time that it didn't really matter what the penalty was and we put it up there and if they convict them, great. And if they get a good sentence, good. But I never really, it didn't bother me. Having said that, most of my convictions, I rarely lost one. I'd just like to digress for a moment, Dave. What happens if I'm a young policeman next to you and I decide I don't want to become a detective? I'm happy to stay in uniform. Does that limit my career chances? 40 years ago, I'd say yes. Now, I would say not at all. These days, I think they have trouble attracting good quality people into the CI to be detectives. Uh, it's a much harder job and it doesn't have the, the kudos that it had back in the 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even the 2000s. So no, there's nothing, if that's what they want, that's fine, but they were often seen as limited experience because yeah. it's a whole different, different game in the CIB. Okay, so you passed the course, you're a young detective. Where did they send you to? I got posted to Carlton CIB. Um, so a, y- a young detective there, what's he doing? So routine, routine's probably diminishing the importance of the crimes, but generally routine investigations, house burglaries, minor frauds, crimes involving employees in the workplace, assaults, rapes, some minor drug activity, generally run-of-the-mill kind of crimes, not complex, not high profile. A couple of really complex ones I was lucky enough to be involved in at Carlton. First one was this guy called Bill Dobson and he was an old painter and docker, an old crook who found out he had a namesake called Bill Dobson who was a Jesuit priest who'd gone to Melbourne University and old Bill Dobson found out about that and was quite a rounded person, got a job at at Melbourne University teaching economics, assuming... The painter and docker did? yes assuming the identity of the original Bill Dobson. By all accounts, he was quite good at it. Uh, the students were quite in- engaged in it. And the university found out about it because a person contacted the uni f- to do a reunion and said, I'm trying to track down Bill Dobson. I said, Bill Dobson's a lecturer here. No, I don't think so. He became a Jesuit priest. Well, he's still here. Here he is. That's not him. And the whole thing unraveled. So Melbourne University, to their credit reported it, and I'm sure that they mulled over it intensely, thinking the reputational damage here is quite bad, but they took a big deep breath and they got on the phone, so I got that brief, and the students that I interviewed thought he was great. He certainly knew, he knew his topic, but he was, he was not qualified to do it. So he, he went to prison for that uh, because the charges were obtaining a financial advantage by deception, purporting to be someone who was not and earning a salary from it. So that was a bit out of left field. Uh, the next one was a, was a bombing uh, attempt up at a, a Food Plus store up in North Carlton where a couple of doors down a business called the Bluebird Cafe uh, were running a successful business till Food Plus opened up and then their business went down. So they firebombed it and he rebuilt. Business went up at the Bluebird. Food Plus reopened. Business went down at the Bluebird. He sent some people in there to hold it up and trash the place the third time, he actually wired it up with bombs and uh, he'd wired up the whole building and ran a detonator and a lead cord down the laneway from the store back to the cafe. The intention is blowing the building up. The debts would blow the cord off. He'd wind the cord up and we'd be none the wiser, except the father of the store went out the back and saw the wires and reported it. So he panicked. He didn't detonate, uh, luckily. Thank goodness, yeah. I know. So we had a building wired up with explosives and it was a very good uh, bomb tech from the special operations group called Dennis Tipping who diffused all those bombs over hours until it was rendered safe. Then we went and arrested Guy, put him up before the courts. We had Betty King, who was our prosecutor. Betty, um, Betty's a former guest on the show. And a really interesting character who was the defence barrister and he was blind and I cannot remember his name. But he ran a fairly robust defence. The evidence was pretty overwhelming and this individual was convicted. So um, at Carlton in my time, they were the two big profile jobs that I got to be involved in. And so they're big profile judges. If Betty King, you would either be in the county court or later the Supreme for a 
charge like that, probably the county, county I'm court. guessing. That's a sophisticated court. Yes. And therefore you've got to have your brief well prepared. Yes. Again, did they teach you about how to prepare a brief, what you needed to have in evidence to succeed yes. or to have the best chance of success? Yeah. So once you're appointed into the CIB as a detective, you need to attend the detective training school within the first 12 months. 12-week course, pretty intense. Is often likened to a diploma course, but it was full on. You got one go at it. If you didn't pass the course, you could never, you'd be put back to uniform and you could never try again. So a lot of pressure that we lived under. And that taught you more complex processes, rules of evidence, managing informers, interrogation techniques. Now that's not that funny way to, to describe it, but we, would t- we were taught very early that a confession was a good start to an investigation. So it was all about um, how do you build a brief, what are the avenues of inquiry you can pursue, where can you go, and then it's about corroborating it and building on it and building on it until you've got a really strong brief. That's Carlton. Then, Carlton, you move on to what back in the 80s and 90s at least was a very high-profile section of the police force being the armed robbery squad. Yep. What was the armed robbery squad and why did we, the community, need a specific squad for armed robberies? Because bank arm robberies on banks and payroll trucks were prolific, so there was a dedicated squad set up back in back in about seventy three, I think it was, that had squad uh, entirely focused on investigating arm robberies on banks. Hard job, dangerous job. There were six crews in the squad, twenty eight of us in total, and our mandate, our criteria to investigate was arm robberies on any bank or armoured truck or those involving extreme violence, but it was pretty much banks. And I was I was invited in, which was a great honour, um, great adventure, scary. But when I went in there in 88, we were attending maybe one to two bank hold-ups a week. When my tenure finished four, four and a bit years later, there was maybe one or two a month. Armed robberies, professional armed robberies were done by gangs that would work and we would work on the gangs. A lot of surveillance activity following around and I think the crooks worked out that it became a high-risk job with little return. Banks changed the way they ran their businesses, their cash handling procedures were different. The chance of being caught were really high. Every copper wants to catch a bank robber. Uh, chance of being shot were reasonably high and there was a particular period in the late 80s where they were killing us and we were killing them. It was a real wild west. In Victoria particularly had a really vile violent patch. So the squad was there to investigate that activity alone. Other squads specialised, and but this was up the front end. You mentioned it was scary and frightening, and I read somewhere where you said on certain occasions you think to yourself, well, I could die today. Mm. How did you cope with that? I mean, you, no support, no mentors or no um, psychologist or counsellors or anyone like that? No. Just, just tough it out? Tough it out. They were good people. You know, you relied on the uh, on your squad members, everyone relied on each other. And, you know, we were tight, we were effective, we were well-trained. One job in particular I can reflect on, sitting in a car out east, you'd start at four in the morning, the surveillance crews would be following targets around and not knowing what they're going to do or where they're going to go. And if they if they hit a bank, then our job was to stop them. So stop them means a gunfight, potentially a gunfight. Potentially, yeah. So we'd, we'd, be in, we'd sit in the car... Ceramic plated vest, pistol grip, shotguns, ankle guns, sitting in the car waiting for this something to happen. So there were some days like that when I was thinking, I don't know why I'm, what, what am I doing here? <laughs> and we, we were, I was involved in running one shooting incident, but most of the times they were quickly and professionally executed and, and the rest done. William and Lonsdale is brought to you by Greens List, one of the leading multidisciplinary barristers' lists in Australia. Greens List believe in promoting conversation around the ideas and issues that shape not only our legal system, but our wider community. Dave, one group of players in this scenario of crimes, and particularly armed robberies, who maybe don't get talked about or considered as much, are the witnesses. It seems to me, from their point of view, to give evidence would be highly stressful and potentially dangerous. Did you support them? Did you help sort of carry them through the process so they felt supported and and safe? 
Absolutely, we did. Particularly in the armed robbery squad when you're dealing... So there's different types of witnesses, as you would appreciate. The, the witnesses who are the victims of the crime, where they're the bank tellers where the crook comes in and sticks a gun at their head and says, I'm going to do him, drop him to his knees, or they belt them, pistol whip them. They see what's really a small barrel of a shotgun, which looks like a cannon to them. Their, their images they'll never, that will never leave them. Our job when we is to get the evidence of what they saw down but support them. So we become quasi-counsellors in a way and we manage them and we help them and support them through that process from when, they, from when the crime happens, when we attend the scene of the bank, to the statements that you take and then potentially an identification. So we get the crooks coming, you need to identify them. That's very stressful for them because they know and you've got to tell them if you identify that person, you're going to be expected to come to court and say that's him. Then we have the committal proceedings and then the trial and then often the retrial or in some cases the jury gets discharged and they come back and do it again. And there are some criminals that are very good at obstructing and delaying the process purely with the intention of thwarting the justice process altogether. So they get sick of it. And so you've got to maintain, you've got to develop a rapport and start a relationship with those victims. And that will carry through often for years. In the Dietrich case, it went for many years. Now, the Dietrich case is a guy who, I think Olaf Dietrich was his given name. Yes. He changed his name to Hugo Rich. Yes. And he was an armed robber. Yes. And a murderer. Yes. So Dietrich and two other accomplices, uh, we investigated them for a series of bank hold-ups and armoured truck heists. Quite a number of them over a period of time. It was a very extensive operation, probably the biggest, it is the biggest investigation I ever did in my time in the police force. The investigation ran for many months. We had surveillance crews following them. We had phone taps. Uh, when they were eventually arrested, we had an entire house full of items that we painstakingly worked through. So these guys would steal cars. And on this particular case, they would steal cars from Melbourne's long-term car park because they could use them before the owner came back and reported them. At the airport. Them, at the airport, before they reported them stolen. And they were all the particular model of Ford, all broken in the exact same way. It was about 11 cars over a period of time they stole. That's how we got onto them, doing stakeouts at the car park, hoping to catch them, and we did. Bit of luck, a lot of luck on our side to get that break. So we found evidence that from the cars that were stolen from cassette tapes that had little cracks in it and an engineer got in court and said, oh, that's my cassette tape and we found it in Dietrich's flat. Well, what do you say it's yours? Oh, because I'm fascinated by the cracks and I used to look at it all the time. Like, great witness. How can you beat that? Another guy won an umbrella in a golf tournament. So like they would do a hold up and steal $100,000 and then take the cassette and the umbrella out of the boot. Sort of petty crimes in some ways, can't, can't help themselves. But that was a really complex matter that went for years. And, and his objective, when we locked him up that night, he's, he said, you guys got no idea what you're in for. Oh, really? Yep. He called it exhausting the opposition and his intention was to just wear us down and wear us down and wear us down until we, people just gave up. Well, that was never going to happen with him and it didn't. But he deliberately did things to make the case against him run four years. Yes, he did. In the committal proceeding, which went, which is where the evidence is tested, so we provide a hand-up brief to the defence and they work through that. They decide who they want to call. He decides he wants to call everyone because he can. So when they're testing the strength of the evidence, when well, you're having a particularly bad day because the evidence was going so well and it was because of two particular victims of the hold-ups had identified him. His response to that was to bronze up. So for your listeners, bronzing up is when you strip naked, cover yourself with your own excrement and then walk back into court. Really? Yeah, yeah that's a favourite, one of his favourite party tricks. So the court doesn't sit for the day. In the trial, it, when he knew the identification witnesses were about to come in, he would throw a tantrum, abuse the judge, sack his counsel, try and get the jury discharged, or he'd let them give evidence, try and get the jury discharged then and make them come back because there's a limit on what these victims can do. So again, it gets back to us managing them and supporting them through that process so that we, we get to the end. But ultimately you did manage them and support them through the process and he was convicted. He was, yes. He got 15, he got 15 with 12 on the bottom. He got out, was out a couple of years and then he murdered a, an armor guard guy, got convicted of that and now he's back in prison. I don't think he's going to get out. He'd certainly hope not. 
in this intimate involvement with the court process, part of your job, what relationships like with lawyers? But, well, with both prosecution lawyers and defence lawyers, solicitors and barristers. So let me just go back to the beginning. When I started out as a really junior constable, the defence barristers were the enemy. They were going to get in the way of us getting justice. That's how we saw them. <laughs> it didn't take long to uh, understand that that's not their role, and, but that's just a bit of a maturity thing that you work your way through. As you get into more complex investigations, the relationship with the prosecutor is critical. So for the Dietrich case, the, the OPP assigned Carolyn Douglas and Ray Gibson as our prosecutors. And we had that connection with them right from the beginning, which was a little unusual because you don't usually get a prosecutor assigned to you until well after. But we got them right at the beginning. And particularly with Ray, he's a KC now. And Silk. Yeah. A Silk. We would take Ray around and, and he, he learnt about our processes and how we operated. And we would have meetings about corroboration. Everything was about corroborating, corroborating, get more information, get more detail. The other two investigators with me, Graham Kent, who was our sergeant, and Mick Gunn, the three of us, we spent so much time analysing the evidence and looking to corroborate it, right back to the phone taps, to the surveillance logs, to the items in the cars that we could connect him back. The more corroboration that we could find, the stronger the brief. And I'll use this analogy, Michael, it's... It's a bit like building a car. So the police investigator is, we go and manufacture a car and we build it and we think it's strong and we think it's good and we tested it. Then we give it to the prosecutor who's the salesman. He needs to sell that car to the jury. The jury don't always want to buy that car because they don't like it or the defensive convinced them it's too dangerous to, to drive that. Most of the time that worked. And But that relationship with the prosecutor is really important. For the trial, that long time, we had daily briefings before court, after court, weekends. It was very consuming for all of us. When you say weekends, a case like the Dietrich slash Rich case, I'm assuming you live the 24-7. Yep. Four years. 24-7 in, in, in periods. So during the investigation phase and the lead up to the arrest, it's 24-7. You're just working. You know, you get phone calls, the telephones are tapped, the mon operators would ring up and say, we've just heard a conversation, they're going to do this. So you'd have to be on tap all the time. Once the arrests are made, there's a little bit of pressure off, but you do have a time frame to work to. So there's a lot of work, it's seven days a week getting the brief ready. And then when the committal starts, you're back onto it. When the trial's on, it's full time. So any court proceedings, it is a full time job. And then the weekends are often spent chasing up. Ray or Caroline might want something. Can you go and do this? Can you get that? You now work and, and head up Police Veterans Victoria, which obviously, or it seems to me to be obvious, is a, it provides a much needed service because people working like that, how you worked, are surely going to burn out. Yeah, absolutely. And were you, at the time, conscious of the possibility of burning out and trying to implement strategies for yourself not to burn out? Uh, yes, I was very conscious of it. At that time in my life, I uh, so you leave the squad and you go and get promoted back to uniform. That's what we all did then, back to be uniform sergeant. Then you're doing an eight-hour shift, you knock off, someone else takes over responsibility. So you're only on for eight hours a day instead of 24. Getting out of those squad environments is really important. I didn't go back into it. I started having, I got married, started having a young family. That wasn't the life I wanted for my kids to grow up, not even knowing I was never home. So you can take other jobs. It's important to have a break. It's important to have a break from being a detective and it's important to get out of the squads and do something else for a while. And if you're determined to go back, great. But there's guys I know that spend 25 some years plus like in the homicide squad. I heard it described PTSD as like a, every death this guy investigated was a book and he had a, he had a library in his mind and every death investigator was another book he put in this library until all the shelves were filled. And then the book started falling out and hitting him on the head. That was PTSD because uh, he just had too many books. Some of them don't know when to get out. And the ones that don't, that's their lifestyle, that's the ones that pay, often pay a higher price. So you've got you, Police Veterans Victoria, for former members. Yes, but what about current members who've been in a squad for 5, 10, 15 years mm. and are suffering post-traumatic stress disorder? Within the force, is there, there the are support they need? There are mechanisms in place now. Um, they have a peer support program. 
So there's about, I think there's about 900, maybe not that many, but there's a lot of peer supporters who are trained. Serving members can reach out to anyone like that and confide in and get some support. They've got the welfare services, the psychology unit. There's a whole lot of mechanisms in place now that, that help for that. But in my day, there was nothing. Our, um, our debrief was at the pub. Yeah, yeah. And to be fair to the pub, as long as you didn't become addicted to alcohol, I guess it did serve a useful purpose to well, debrief with your mates. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. We debriefed and we celebrated the successes and um, it was a social thing. Uh, I, I didn't see anything bad about it. Looking back, there was probably too much, too much drinking that was good for us. But uh, at the time, that was how we managed it and, and it worked. The squad was the armed robbery squad in my time, back most of its time, were highly performing, very effective uh, squads with really dedicated investigators, some really clever people in that squad that did really good work and that's what kept us up. Can I just keep going on this idea of then and now mm-hmm. in, a, in a more general sense, the more general sense of the police force and how do you think the police force is viewed by our community now as opposed to it, what it was when you started in the force 40-odd years ago? Well, it certainly changed a lot, Michael. In my, when I started, there was a, a, a level of fear and respect and one sort of went with the other as well. That made life was a lot simpler and that made us far more effective. And there was a, an environment where you could deal with minor street kid issues effectively without bringing it into the court system. We, we were out and about, we were on the road, we were in everyone's faces all the time. In South Melbourne, we owned, we owned the town. We knew all the kids. We knew all the local crooks. We knew who the good crooks were, the dumb crooks, the young ones, the old ones. We, we had relationships and sadly that seems to have gone. These days they say half the public hate coppers for what they did and the other half hate them for what they didn't do. And so you think there's less respect for the police force now than the, there was certainly when you started? Yes. Uh, not just for police, Michael. There's less respect for teachers, covers. I think I think there's an element of parents that expect the local policeman and the local teacher to raise their kids for them, and there's a price that's coming from that. So uh, authority figures in general are no longer respected. I mean, to be fair, uh, some of those authority figures didn't deserve the respect they got. No, not all. And they deserve not to have it now. Mm. So... The other one that, that interested me was domestic violence because I sort of think you might have come into the force at the time when domestics, as they were called, were sort of not considered very serious no. and you'd sort of try and keep out of them if you could because it was a husband and wife or partner to partner yep. issue, not really a legal issue. True. Uh, I think domestic violence has always been there through society. It's far more prevalent now than it was, but in my early days of policing, we get called to a domestic. Um, we defuse it by taking the husband out, locking him up for four hours and saying we better not get called back, and we didn't. I don't think that solved it because it just didn't get reported, but we had a fairly simplistic approach to it, and at the time we thought that was pretty effective, but we never actually went back. Sometimes you would. Sometimes you'd go back and revisit and check on, make sure everything's all right. But in those days, there was that level of, I don't want the coppers to come back. And, and my understanding for the present time, Dave, is that intervention orders are a huge burgeoning area of court work. So things aren't being, well, they aren't being swept under the carpet. They're, they're coming to court and there are intervention orders being made against yes. normally males. Yeah. Do you think it's better? No. I think the situation's far worse than it's ever been. Intervention orders have got limited value. Laws only apply to people who are prepared to comply with them. And if they're not, an intervention order means nothing. And sometimes it's a trigger to escalate detention. You go to court, we absolutely know in a family environment that women that are murdered by their partners in this country is is appalling. So it's not better. I don't know the answer to it. But intervention orders have got limited value. The other and, area which I, I picked up on a comment you made, which I found interesting, was sexual assault cases where you said you often can't win them. Mm. Why is that? Well, because with those types of investigations, it's very much the jury need to listen to the evidence of the victim and it's one word against the other. And when you, unless you've got that level of corroboration, which I talked about before, and if it gets down to that, then it depends on how 
how the victim comes across as a witness in front of the jury and how the accused, if they choose to give evidence, how they come across and the jury will form their opinion. And as we know, it's a proving case beyond reasonable doubt. That's right. And word against word, unless you've got corroboration, it can be very hard to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so that's really, really difficult. Let's move on now. After about 20 years in the force, you leave the force yep. and go and work for a major bank mm-hmm. as their in-house investigator mm. or in charge of their in-house investigation team. Why did you leave the force? Well, I had a colleague that I used to work in our robbery squad with who was in, who'd gone into this bank and he was always offering it to me as an opportunity, but not me. I was still locked in the Crawford production days. Uh, I wanted to be a sergeant. I wanted to be a detective sergeant. I wasn't going to leave. But I got to the point where I actually was trying to get a posting down the coast and I didn't get it. And this job was on the table and I thought, well, you know what? I don't want to die wondering, so I'll give it a go. I asked for leave without pay. Neil Cromley was the chief of the day and he said, no, either stay or leave. I said, fine, I'll leave. So I left. Um, That's all I'd known. It was very confronting. But um, within a week, I was sort of got into the mode and the work was really investigating criminal conduct by employees. I had more variety in that role and I overdid in policing. Murder, rape, gun running. Murder, rape? Drug trafficking. We had a slavery case. Bribery, corruption, Are these within theft, Australia or are these overseas? Uh, a lot of them in Australia. A lot of them are in Australia, yeah. yep. So what did you – you'd investigate them and bring them to a certain point and, and them hand the them over to the police? Correct. Or you might work together? Uh, generally. Um, so ha- how this came about was that the demands on policing, particularly investigators, were so high that uh, the police forces started saying to big corporations, you're going to have to self-investigate this stuff. So it actually created a whole industry that came out of it in – Financial, insurance, government departments. Uh, it's a in- very broad industry now where the investigation is often managed in-house and to the point you put a brief together and then you hand it over to the police and then you become the witness for them. But there was a lot of ex- a lot of former police that were in those roles so we knew how to put a brief together. Getting a banker and a copper together was good because the banker could teach you understand the processes of banking and how it worked and the policeman knew how to how to sell a jail sentence. I mean, it was different because you had, you had a suspect to start with and you work backwards. Uh, often in policing you get a crime, try and work out who did it. Yeah. In-house yeah, yeah. it's different. So, yeah, I had 12 teams uh, after. Uh, eventually I had 12 teams in 11 countries, investigators reporting up, uh, dealing with the whole range of issues. Extraordinary, really. Hmm. Did you find it satisfying? Yes, it was good. I mean, it's different because you're just an employee. So you don't have any authority. And you don't have the investment in the community that you have as a policeman? No, that's right. So it's, a, you, it's like the same, same work, different master. But the master was corporate and they'll decide what you do and what you won't do and if they don't like what you do, there's consequences. Whereas in policing, they can't get rid of you, can they? But there was satisfaction in it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, particularly the overseas teams. They had great teams, guys in PNG, Vietnam, Indonesia... India, Philippines, Fiji. I really enjoyed working with them. They're all locals? They're all local people. Some Form, ex-police. Former policemen? Some. Some were. The guy, my mate, the guy in Vietnam, um, both of them that reported to me were both former police. Cambodia was not. Uh, Singapore was not. Hong Kong was. Uh, India was ex-military. So different, different disciplines. They had the level of skill that you expected of them? No, no. It's very much start from the bottom. And then, then teach them. So you had a teaching role as well. Yeah. So anything big, I'd be over there, um, leading them through it. Some of the guys are quite clever, but um, and it was a different environment, Michael. You get, you know, working in Cambodia where the police expect a facilitation payment to take the brief up. I mean, you can't. Um, Indonesia, where if the regulator, if the can, government, can I just clarify, facilitation um, payment is a nice phrase for bribe. Correct. Yeah, that's right. Well, it's, actually not, it's actually not a bribe. Well, all we're doing is asking them to put someone up before the court. Well, if you want us to do that, you've got to give us some money. So we're not, uh, we're not paying them to not do something. Yeah. They want to be paid to do something. Yeah. 
Kind of a bribe. <laughs> but it's, it's the culture. I mean, uh, yeah. it's the culture and it's been going on for a lot longer than uh, uh, either you or the, or the bank. Yeah, absolutely. So Indonesia was tricky because the government did not want uh, an Australian in their country investigating their employees. It's their bank. It's their people. So you have an advisory role. So it's a very fine line to navigate. But you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. There's a lot of frustrations at the top, a lot of hypocrisy. I'll give you an example. Senior executive in an institutional business steals about four grand on his credit card, takes his team out for lunch, says he's entertaining clients. He's not. That person was identified, investigated, told to resign, given a reference, given a big send-off, told what a great performer he was. And at the same week, they wanted to sack and they wanted me to prosecute a teller who sells $5 out of a drawer, you know. Are you serious? I'm not doing that. Uh, so when you say I'm not doing that because of the complete disparity between how they treated one person and the other one, and one being an executive and one not being executive, mm. what were the consequences for you? Well, policies at the time were that I had the authority not, not to not to proceed. So I just went with the policy and said, no, I'm not doing it. The police won't take a $5 theft. And why would you? She's going to leave. So we need to make a stand. You know, that's that's not making a stand. You were there with the bank for about 10 years? 19. Oh, 19, sorry, apologies. Which takes us up to now where you are the head of Police Veterans Victoria. How did you come to be involved in Police Veterans Victoria? Did you apply for a job there or did you start as a volunteer or what did you do? No, I started as a volunteer. Um, after the four members were killed on the Eastern Freeway in April 2020, I found out about the organisation in its fledgling days and they were looking for veteran members to volunteer as peer support officers. So I put my hand up for that and said, yep, I want to do that. And then when I started that role, then I was asked if I was interested in running the organisation because it was in a fledgling stage. I said, sure, it's a noble cause. No one, it's something, it needs to be done, it needs to be set up properly. So I went in there in the early days and like I said at the start of the interview, we kind of knocked it apart, started it again, restructured it, um, did policies, had a risk management framework, started to recruit the right people to be peer support officers because a lot of them are actually, they want to help but they're quite troubled. So you've got to find the right people who are supportive. And we've been really lucky. I've got some brilliant volunteers who give up a lot of their time and energy supporting people that they don't even know just because they're worried about them and they want to make sure they're looked after. And up until now, no one was looking after them. How do you keep track of people who leave the force? You know, so I've been in the force for 10 years, I leave and effectively I drop off everyone's radar. That's right. How do you how do you find out about me? How do you? We don't unless you come forward. So we're trying to. The two biggest challenges we have still is being financial, getting enough money to keep us running, and raising awareness of what who we are and what we're trying to do. So we've had a couple of corporate lunches. Um, our funding now comes through serving police through payroll subscriptions, workplace giving. That's the only way we're funded. But if a police member leaves tomorrow. And and don't tell us, we don't, no idea. I've got 5,000 members, there's probably 10,000 out there that haven't joined us. So we're trying to get to them. We're trying, we ask the employer, can you tell me who's left so we can contact them? No, that's a breach of privacy, so we can't tell you anything. So we need to let them know who we are and hope they'll come to us. But the more, what I've found is the more we do, uh, the more we promote our activity, then the word gets around. So we've got to We've got a seat at the table now, which has taken years. Shane, the Chief Commissioner is our patron, the Governor's now our patron in chief, so we've got some legitimacy. Um, people see the work that we're delivering. Um, other states are seeing it. So there's an awareness building, but it's still a long way to go. Do you find it satisfying work? Very satisfying. Sometimes it's hard. There's a bit of compassion fatigue that comes. Um, so I try and separate from that, and we're building it our organisation broader. So it's a community. When coppers leave the job, loss of purpose and loss of community are the two biggest triggers for a downward spiral in their mental health. So they've fought the good fight. They've put on a uniform or put on a badge and they've gone out there and they've run into trouble when everyone else runs away from it. And there's some altruistic views on it. But when you leave, there's nothing there. And it's confronting for them. And they a lot of them can't cope and then they sit around with nothing to do and they start dwelling on it. 
I dwell about the jobs I've seen, the the death, the destruction, the abuse, what the public, what people do to each other is extraordinary. And so when they've got time to sit and dwell, then it affects them. So we try and give them somewhere to belong and try and keep them on, on the up, give them other purpose, put on a different uniform, volunteer somewhere, do some work with us, have a purpose in your life. So the more we can steer that, the idea is to keep those who leave the job happy, stay happy and healthy. Those who are not, we help them recover. And those who are really troubled, we support. That's what we're trying to deliver. Lives in the Law is proudly sponsored by City Maps Illustrated. Their recent publication, The Melbourne Map, is a celebration of our wonderful city. This stunning, hand-drawn illustration, which took more than three years to create, is available as an art print, jigsaw puzzle and calendar. The perfect acquisition for your home, office or corporate gifting. Dave, with what obviously are very limited resources and a great need, do you have to, on a day-to-day basis, support former members as well as manage PVV? Absolutely, I do. I've got that many hats. Some days I can't can't keep up. Yeah, I, I had one yesterday. Last week I had three. Um, we get about 20 a month that come through in various levels of complexity, but yeah, my job is to run the organisation. I'm chief IT, HR, compliance, marketing, fundraising, PR, podcasts, you name it. I, I wear them all. And so you, a member, either either a member of Police Veterans Victoria or a former member of the police force who's not a member of Police Veterans, might ring you and have a individual conversation with you about, I'm struggling, yes. I've got no purpose, and so then you help that person through that. And that may be a relationship which you develop with that person where you're talking to them once a week or so on the phone or catching Some, up for a coffee or something. Yep, sometimes I try and hand them off to one of the volunteers. I've got to keep the volunteers engaged because they sign up, they want to get the referrals as well. Yep. But there are some, uh, some veterans that I know I've st- stayed with, um, but as much as I can... I'll hand off after that conversation and get someone else to pick up the relationship. I was surprised, Dave, to read that out of the your veterans, the veterans, a quarter, 25% are severely impacted. 25% of all police will be impacted by some form of post-traumatic stress. That's a statistic mm. that is accepted. But 75% are okay. 25 is still a lot. It's a lot. Uh, One in every four is a lot. Absolutely. And you would think if you were the state government, you would think well, we've got a body here that wants to help these people, maybe we should support that body. Well, not just that. A large part of police recruits come from police families and police families are tending to say to their people, don't do it, it isn't worth it, which is pretty sad. In other important areas such as teaching and health professionals, we as a community are struggling to get enough people. We haven't got enough. Correct. Is policing the same? Yes, absolutely. They're losing more than they're recruiting in. The attrition rate's quite high. The long-term absences, I think there's nearly, there's more than 800 serving members on long-term sick leave. The majority of that is mental health related and they're unlikely, any of them, to come back into the workforce. So they're short, they're closing the stations. Uh, You don't see patrols like you once did. They just don't have the resources. That's something we should all be worried about. Absolutely. It's a, it's a community problem. What is the um, size of the police force? How many members, serving members are there? Uh, around 18,000. And so, so 800 is somewhere a bit under 5%. That's right. It's a lot, isn't it? Yes. And then you take into account those that are on leave, long service leave, annual leave, days off from shift work. Um, no wonder the stations are tight. And so they may, have, they may well be getting numbers through and we go and talk to the recruits every fortnight to get them to sign up and support us because we're going to be there for looking, to look after them as well. You're helping the veterans. Is, is there a parallel body to you helping serving members? Well, there are a whole mecha- there's a mechanism within the Victoria Police, uh, the, the, wealth, the wellbeing services team. So they've got welfare officers, psychologists. Um, there's that peer program for serving members. Basically, a lot of it's down to the line managers, the OCs, the officers in charge. They got to look after their people as well. So, yeah, there's a me- there's, there are mechanisms to support the serving members, but what I see when they leave is that it all drops away. Dave, you've 
observed our police force for the last 40 odd years. You have been intimately involved, particularly in the last four or five years through Police Veterans Victoria. So you've got a unique insight into the force. If you're commissioner for a day and you could make any change, what would it be? I'd I'd reintroduce consorting laws. Consorting laws were very effective because that was a... Can you please explain to our audience what the consorting laws laws were? It used to be be a criminal offence for for known criminals to associate with each other and we'd pull them over on patrols, young Connie, and you'd get a call from the consorting squad or the major crime squad as it became later saying, you've stopped X and Y, can you give me a file note on that? And if they associated more than a certain number of times, they were charged. Well, the courts didn't like it and defence barristers didn't like it, but it was a pretty good way of keeping tabs on crooks, who was who. And it was a good control. Uh, If I was the chief for the day, I'd try and get that back in. Okay, you might have to be the Premier as well, I think. Uh, Yeah, there's probably a law in the way of that. (laughs) Exactly. Dave, thank you very much for an absolutely fascinating conversation this morning and and I think an important conversation so we know more about our police force and the difficulties that they operate under and the support they get and don't get. Very grateful for you coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Show notes from today's episode can be found at greenslist.com.au forward slash podcast. There you'll find links to things we've talked about in this episode, a transcript of the show and some wonderful photos of our guests. If you're enjoying Lives in the Law, please tell your networks, subscribe, rate and review the show. Your host is former lawyer and Greens List clerk, Michael Green. Our show is produced and edited by me, Catherine Green, mixed and mastered by Windmill Audio and recorded by Alex McFarlane, who also wrote and performed all the music for the series. We're coming to you from the iconic Owen Dixon Chambers on the corner of William and Lonsdale Streets in our beautiful city of Melbourne. We acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of this land and pay our respect to their elders past and present. There is no doubt that conversations about justice have been taking place on this land for thousands of years and we are privileged to continue that discussion here today.